How can we resolve conflict and diffuse tension in a way that empowers both parties? This is the Leaders of Transformation podcast. And on this show, we interview difference makers and world changers who are disrupting for good. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Nicole Jansen. And our guest today is Hesha Abrams. She is a professional peacemaker, an internationally acclaimed master attorney mediator, negotiator, and the author of the book, Holding the Calm. We're actually gonna talk about that book here today. She is known for crafting highly creative settlements and resolutions in very difficult matters. And let me tell you, I read her book and it is fantastic. I mean, just for the stories alone, it is worth the read, but there's so much in it. And, uh, and if you've ever found yourself in the middle of a conflict or a tense situation, I mean, who hasn't, uh, you're gonna wanna listen to this whole episode and in, in the conversation, I know it's gonna be fantastic. So Hesha, welcome to Leaders Transformation. We're glad you're here today. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure. And before we dive in, I do wanna do a shout out to Podmatch. I always like to thank those who uh, support this show and send us amazing guests. And so Podmatch uh, sent us uh, your uh, Hesha's information and we would just really appreciate them supporting the show. So thank you to them. All right, let's talk about your book. And who specifically did you write this book for? So it's interesting, it morphed and changed. So I've given literally 10,000 speeches in my life, sort of the Malcolm Gladwell, you know, expertise thing. And people are always saying, you got to write a book, you got to write a book, because, you know, not everyone can afford to come to a lecture where I'm paid a lot of money to come do this big entertainment thing is usually what keynotes really are. And I said, sure, I'll write a book. When? You know, two, two in the morning, three in the morning, you're working all the time. And I was a mom and then became a grandmother, like there was no time. And then a couple of years ago, I had a hysterectomy and I was grounded for six months and knock on wood, I was fine. It was good, but I was literally grounded for six weeks. I said, I can write the book. It just poured out of me. And part of the reason I wanted to do this is there are seasoned professionals who know how to do this kind of stuff, but these are tools, the secrets of resolving conflict and diffusing tension should be for everybody. We should be teaching this in schools. Yes. And the reason I, it's a long title, Holding the Calm, The Secret to Resolving Conflict and Diffusing Tension. And I was really hesitant to have the title so long, but the reason I had to add the diffusing tension is all conflict, 100% of it starts with tension. And the tension can be angry, or it can be the uh-huh, uh-huh. It can be any of that. And if, the analogy I want to give, because this is really when you talk about who it's for, it's for us. It's for humans. Because the techniques I use with big, 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 fancy schmancy CEOs and big billion dollar cases, which is literally what I do now, to small claims court case, whose cat peed on the rug, or your teacher, your kid's teacher or coach, or your neighbor, or your colleague at work, or your boss, or your idiot sister-in-law, all of that is just, we don't know how to deal with conflict. And so the analogy I like to give everybody is spaghetti sauce. You drop it on the counter, you wipe it up with a wet sponge, no big deal. You leave it overnight, you're scraping that sucker off of the spatula. You leave it three or four months or three or four years, it is old and moldy and nasty. That is conflict, my friends. And so the question is, why don't we wipe it up with a sponge in the beginning? Because we don't know how, because we're scared, because I don't know what your reaction is going to be. Maybe I'll make it worse. Maybe I put my head in the sand like an ostrich. Maybe it'll go away. Maybe it's not going to be as bad as I thought. And it's always as bad as you thought, because people don't forget little resentments and little I was offended by you, or you didn't include me, or you didn't value or respect me, or all that kind of stuff. And we're now seeing it with the violence in our society. It's nuts like squirrels, you know, squirreling it away for the winter. So that's why I did this book so that every, and it's easy. It's, I, I insisted on it being paperback. I edited it to get it as short and tight as I possibly could. So it's a good two hour read. So it's simple and easy that everyone can have access to some of this stuff to wipe the spaghetti sauce up when it's wet. What a great analogy. And I was picturing that thinking, yes, there's a lot of spaghetti on that has been caked on for so many years. And then you get a pandemic and then all heck breaks, breaks loose. 
<clears throat> and people are like freaking out and, and it's like, what's up with that? It yeah. hasn't, doesn't have to do with that. It's all of the buildup over the yeah. years. And now you have this, this issue that is, that is like the, the, the pressure valve that keeps building, 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 and now it yeah. blows. Well, and we don't have, you know, people don't have the skill set. I mean, if I like you and we really like each other and it's calm and it's easy, sure. But let's do the advanced class when I don't like you and I don't trust you and you think so differently from me and I'm scared or I'm angry or, or fill in the blank. Yeah. Our skill sets are non-existent. And it's almost like we're cavemen and cave women shoving food in our mouths. And I want to say, here's a fork, here's a knife, here are chopsticks. You know, use use one of these tools, just going to make life easier and better. Because if you can get it while it's early, it's always better, always. But realistically, a lot of times you can't get it while it's better. Okay, the tools still work. You just have to do them a little differently or a little more difficultly. And you know, that's why chapter one in the book is speak into the ears that are hearing you. I don't treat everybody the same. Why yeah. would I treat an introvert the same as an extrovert? Why would I talk to you, Nicole, like I would talk to Joe down the street? Totally different people. You know, and we spend so much time on the diversity, equity, inclusion stuff, which God knows is important. I'm not taking away from that at all. And yet all white women don't think the same. All white men don't think the same. All African-American women don't think the same. All Hispanic men don't think the same. All Asians, blah, 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 fill in the blank. So I don't want to look at you and interact with you by your externality. I mean, you're wearing a black shirt. I'm wearing a white shirt. Why would I even talk to your shirt? That's just silly. I want to take a few minutes and see you. And it's not hard. That's what this holding the calm stuff is. It's very empowering to wear. I don't just listen to you rehearsing what I want to say in my head. I actually see you. Oh, now I got choices. I got options. I got things I could do. It's actually super empowering. Well, there is a challenge though, of course, because if I have all this stuff going on, you mentioned about being angry or frustrated or afraid, afraid or whatever it is, all these things block me from mm -hmm. being fully present with you to see you who you are as who you are. So how do you help people to prepare themselves when we talk about holding the calm i think of i think of first being the calm yeah you know for yourself so that you can actually have an intelligent conversation and not get hijacked by your amygdala you know yep. and run off half cocked exactly and that's a very insightful question which is literally why the very beginning of the book i talk about the amygdala and for the listeners who know what that is just bear with me a minute for those who don't because it's so important it's two small kidney shaped organs in the deep in the back of your brain, kind of above the brain stem. And it's our most primitive part of our brain. We look at something and say, that's a stick, that's food, that's a snake. And we do it in a nanosecond. Well, we do it with people too. We look at people and within a minute, friend or foe. I mean, that happens quick. And our brains just are wired that way so we can see that. And if I think you're foe as opposed to friend, you're not going to give me data and proof. I'm not interested in hearing any of that. My amygdala has gotten triggered. So now what most people do is we react and that creates problems and things we got to deal with. So you need to create space between what your amygdala, your emotions, amygdala is the fear and negativity center in the brain. So we'll always see things through an afraid negative lens, always. So it pops up. I don't want to tell it to go away. I want to know if there's a snake in my path or a predator. I mean, we live in a jungle. This is not Kumbaya. We have difficult, narcissistic, challenging, selfish, broken people that we have to deal with. So I like the fact I've got an early warning device, but it doesn't control. I control. And the prefrontal cortex is here behind the, behind the forehead. And what happens is the amygdala takes over Neuroscientists have proven that when it's active, it's active for what's called a refractory state. And in almost everyone, a refractory state lasts for 20 minutes. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. And so what we tend to do is your amygdala is triggered, your refractory state cont continues. So what do I do? Give you more data, more information, try to listen to you. Try no, 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 no. When you're in a refractory state, your cup is full doesn't matter if it's filled with right stuff or bad stuff or truth stuff or toxic stuff. It doesn't matter. 
It's full. So all I need to do is help that cup empty. And that's the Vux technique that I talk about in the book. It's the sandwich technique. It's the diagnosing technique. It's the wowed, the way out with dignity technique. It's the all of those things we talk about. And so it goes long answer to a very short question. I use holding the calm as a mantra, as a talisman or rabbit's foot for myself, because I'm human. My amygdala can get triggered. But when it's triggered, I don't just act or react. I literally say to myself, I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. Now notice I said it three times and it took four seconds. My amygdala goes, oh, okay, someone's in charge of the bus. The bus isn't just careening down the road with no one knowing what the heck's going on. Now I've created a moat between the emotions that are sucked to my chest and pulled back and into that moat. Now there's space. Now I can think, I can see, I can use a tool. I can say, I can't talk to you right now. I can say, we're going to continue this in five minutes or a half an hour, or let's say it's not safe to do that. I got to go to the bathroom. What's I'm going to do? No, pee here? No, I got to go to the bathroom. But you know, I need some space. Okay, now once I have that space, because I'm holding the calm, I can do it for myself. I can do it for you. I can do it for my kid. I can do it for my teacher. And I'll tell you, I deal with CEOs of big, big companies. They're the same as everybody else. They're just wearing a $5,000 suit. But it's exactly the same because they got an amygdala. They've got an ego. They want to be right. They don't want to be wrong. They don't want to have power taken away from them or be overpowered, just like everybody else. So that's why these holding the calm techniques work so well. Even just the title. That's why I entitled the book that. It's like a mantra to go, I got this. I got this. Yeah. Well, I think most of us are, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say all of us, but most of us have a certain level of intelligence, emotional intelligence, when mm -hmm. it comes to interacting with people. We've been doing it our whole lives. But to your point, yeah, when that when you get hijacked and it's like high emotion, low intelligence, all that goes out the window for that period of time, at least, where we say things that we wish that we hadn't said, we do things that we wish we hadn't, you know, we wouldn't do, we try to, you know, take it back after, but it's, but it's out there, right? It's the spaghetti right. on, the, right. on the, on the counter. So right. now why does injecting logic? I love this in your book. You talked about why logic doesn't work. Rational logic is not the answer to this you know, never. solution. Never. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> never. And so talk about that. Why isn't that? Because that's where a lot of us go, right? We're like, okay, logically, can't you see how this is supposed to I know. Happen? So I always joke when I ever have a room full of, uh, like I'm doing a speech and I have a lot of people, men and women, and the women are really grooving on this a little bit more. Women are much more open to social sciences and we're interconnected beings. We got started that way when we were little girls. If you think about little boys and little girls, and this is not for everybody and it's not you know gender neutral and binary. Now I'm just talking about basic generalities. Little boys generally would play sports. Little girl's play was circular. And so with little boy sports, you punched me, you hit me, we fell down, the ref said no, we move on and they're fine. Little girl sports are, we're an interconnected you know, play. I remember what you did to me last week and I wanna get you back. And so anyone who is engaged in that knows I'm speaking some truth to that. Now, are there exceptions to everything? The 80-20 rule, of course, but it's enough that it's out there that women are just trained early on for this massive, subtle EQ, emotional IQ and interconnectedness with each other. Where men, think about most men having a conversation like this. Most of them, you know, my husband's an engineer. It's like, ah, we have to talk, ah, you know, we have to wait, wait, think about it. What man goes, yes, please, let's talk about our feelings. Okay, 10, 15% of you, God bless you. But the rest say, oh no, I don't really wanna be able to do that. So. It's not trained in us. It's not ready at the ready for us to be able to do that. Yeah. So being able to say, I got some tools, I can do something is so dramatically helpful. So dramatic. And I'm not sure I actually fully answered your question there. So if I didn't, I apologize. Logic. 
So <laughs> logic. That's, yes, I love the way. Yeah, I love the way you tied in about the, the the way males and females handle do that because I can totally relate. And, you know, if they have the, mo if they have the interest, maybe when you were courting with your husband, he was like, oh, tell me more, tell me more. And then after that, it's like, oh, honey, yeah, I've heard it. I've heard it all. I don't I'm, need to hear it again. I'm right. Done. And, and I know that kicks in. Right. Yeah. So anyway, but go, yeah, well, it's the logic. So let me, and you're right. I, I segued out into the male, female thing, but you know, cause women also, you can't use logic with a woman, but this was the joke I was going to make when I'm sitting there, I should say, can you use logic with a woman or a man when an amygdala has been triggered and they're in a refractory state? Just so I can keep that clear. But it's a joke that if you're ever doing a training and the men are there, you know, uh, it's touchy feely crap. What are we doing here? Right. All you have to say is, gentlemen, I want you to think of any fight you've ever had with a woman. You tried to mansplain her why she was wrong, right? You use logic, you use reason, you use rationale. Did it work? And they all crack up every one of them. So it's a great line to use that I offer any of you are doing a training or something, use it and take it because it immediately gets everyone's attention to say, why doesn't logic work? Because first of all, it's your logic and not their logic. And you didn't take the time to unpack first to figure out what the heck was going on. So one more analogy, there's a bomb in the town square. That guy waddles out in his Michelin suit. He didn't just start cutting wires looks, diagnosis. Is it a pressure switch? Is there a toxic thing to be released? What is happening there? We don't do that. We look at you, you're a problem or you're presenting a problem. I'm just going to explain it to you. I'm going to give you facts. I'm going to give you information. And then you're going to think about it the way I think about it and you'll settle down. Well, that has less than a 1% chance of ever working. And the only time it ever does is because there's a massive power imbalance and the other person has to go, Okay. Okay. Boss. Okay. Okay. But it doesn't really ever work. It's those nuts squirreled away for winter. But if I took the time to say, oh, isn't that interesting? That's a different perspective than I have. Can you explain a little more to me about that? Why is that important to you? What does the amygdala do? Calms the heck down. Right. And you'll find 20, 30% of the time, the person after explaining it will go, yeah, that's not really what I meant. I guess it's not that important. They'll talk themselves out of it. That's a third of the time that will happen. And the other part of the time, you will learn more about what they're thinking. And then under the theory of reciprocity, which neuroscience has proven we have as human beings, well, now I kind of sort of have to listen to you, hear your perspective. So who goes first? The one who can hold the calm. Who's the more mature one? That's how that game works. Yeah. So I love in the book where you talk about, and you actually give real live examples of tough situations. And I think about like the one where the, the father he lost the, the, the daughter was, was um, I forget the accident had an accident and then the mom uh, died. And so here you are and you, and, and it was just so powerful there was, there was the distinction between empathy and sympathy. Yeah. Can you speak to that and how you can insert that in? And it was so powerful because it was like done. It was done in that moment, just yeah. by the way that you responded to that. And I'm thinking about those times where you actually, and I know this is through experience and practice, but knowing the time, the timing, like what, what is the best response in that moment? How can people figure out what that, what that is, you know? Yeah. See, that's so good. You are already in diagnostic mode, which by def, if you go into diagnostic mode by simply asking those questions, you've already have one. Literally, mm -hmm. you've already have one just by opening up. To, you'll see more, you'll understand more on how to do that. And yes, I've had 30 something years of experience in the trenches of human conflict, real live, hard stuff. That's why I wrote the book. So people can have these tools and they can use them. Mm -hmm. the, they're easy. You can use them immediately. You don't need a master's degree or take some special master class somewhere. I mean, you can use them immediately and you'll get better with time. And that's why I've got some surefire ones like Vox and Sandwich and some of the things that are just surefire, easier ways to uh, initially connect with someone. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would say, rather than I'm going to resolve this conflict, I'm going to fix you. I'm going to educate you. I'm going to change you. I'm going to build rapport with you. 
That's what I'm going to do. That's step number one. And how do I build rapport with you when you don't like me and you don't trust me or you don't know me or, or, or validation is the duct tape of the neuropersonal world. And I will make a joke. We've got a friend whose son is a chef and he says that bacon is the duct tape of the chef world. <laughs> if you screw up, you just add bacon to it. Nothing is funny since I'm a vegetarian on top of it. But I look at validation is the duct tape of our world. Who is going to, let's say, Nicole, you don't like me. I said something, I did something intentionally, unintentionally. I didn't invite you, Who? whatever, right? And you're, you know, you can, you're being polite and respectful, but you have a little bit of that edge and I can feel that edge. Now, maybe I know why it's there. Maybe I don't. You just go, did I offend her? Like what happened? What did I do? You want to know the best sentence stem in the world to get someone to listen to you? What? Nicole, you know, what's really good about you. Mm. Boom, boom, boom. Who doesn't stop what they're doing and listen to that That's sentence? Brilliant. It's phenomenal. And I give like 10 or 20 uh, sentence stems in there for different occasions. And I tell people, you're not going to remember all 10 of them. Take two, take three and put them on a post-it note and put it on your phone or put it on a note in your phone. So in the moment when your amygdala is triggered, you don't go, oh God, what did Hesha say? What was that? You got it right there. And so let's do the advanced class. Let's say we're at Thanksgiving dinner right? And my idiot brother-in-law just can't stop himself from saying and doing stupid crap. And it's hijacking it. as everyone else do? They sit back and either watch the car accident happen or they fret. Oh, please don't get into a conflict. conflict what do I ruin? Dinner? You know, what are you supposed to do? And then you're the bad guy because right. you're not responding to the idiot saying idiotic things. Surefire thing that works. You know, Uncle John or, you know, Susie or whatever the name is, you know what I really admire about you? Moi? Moi? They will stop instantly. What do you? What about me? And let's say you can say something really validating. Okay, you know how to validate, validate. Well, let's do the advanced class. Let's say you can't because he's an idiot or she's ridiculous or she's nasty or he's stupid or fill in the blank. You can always say, and I have these listed in the book for you, I admire your passion. I admire your discipline. Mm -hmm. You are really uh, concerned about that issue. You take that very seriously. What does that do to the other person? It deflates the giant windbag ego, which is really what's operating there. Listen to me, look at me, I'm powerful, I'm strong, I'm gonna roar. You don't win that with logic and reason. You don't win if you engage with that. I'd rather win without firing a shot. You do something yeah. like that. Everyone else around the table is going to go, you go, <laughs> good for you. And he's yeah. just going to sit back or she's just going to sit back and not know what to say, what just yeah. happened. Like, what? literally, you'll see people go, what just happened? Yeah. And they calm down. So you got to yeah. do it again. Okay, Do it again. It's, and it makes you feel powerful. That's yeah. the part that's so cool about this is that you don't feel powerless. You feel powerful when you have holding the calm tools. Yeah. Well, I think about everybody wanting to be heard, be known, be seen. And what you're doing is you're giving them from a loving standpoint, it could be tactical, but in, in a case, it's like, you know, like, I just want to get through this. But really coming from that loving place of saying this person, what is going on for them? They want to be mm -hmm. heard. They want, there's something in them that mm -hmm. is saying, Hey, make me feel important. You know, Hey, pay mm -hmm. attention to me. And it may be coming out the worst way, but that's what it is. That's going on. Right. It's like the child that doesn't get the acknowledgement from the parent. I think about my brother and my, my niece, uh, one of my nieces came out pushing his buttons and that's because she's exactly like him. So the happy ending of the story is they get along amazing now, but they did not for the longest time. And, and she wanted his approval and it was really hard to like, he, he just kept the things she did to get his approval were not things that were uh, translating on the other side that way that he wanted to approve it. Probably annoyed him more. <laughs> annoyed him more. 
Right. And so I said, if she doesn't get approval from you, if she doesn't get that from you, she's going to get it one day from somewhere. You may not like where it's coming from. And so she, all she wanted is she wanted his approval. And if she didn't get it in doing good things, good things, she finds, she's going to find a way to get it. I mean, she'll, she was a little mischievous. She'd do things. She's like, I'll get you. I'll get you back. This is conflict. Right. And she's a little sneaky little <laughs> six-year-old. And, and yet you could see what was happening with her and how often do we do that even as, as adults, right? And it's like, we, we people don't want to be heard. I look on social media and some people, they react and they get all wrapped up in those comments or at work or whatever the case is. And it's like, somebody just, just, they just want to be heard. I mean, I've had some people and you probably have this, have had this too. It's like these comments and you're like, what, where did that come from? but they just want to be heard. And I think if yeah. we can give people the gift of being heard, acknowledge, you talk about validation, I call it acknowledgement. It's like when they just acknowledged who they are, acknowledge who they are, then they're much more interested. Like you talked about the uh, reciprocity. They're much now more interested in hearing what you have to say. It's so powerful. And I mean, like you said, what I love about it is Absolutely. these tools apply across the board. It's brilliant. And it's so obvious. And yet at the same time, at the same time, why is it so hard? I mean, you think about like, why yeah. is this not being taught? Why is it so difficult for us? You know, to it's so hard because even the teachers in school can't do it. The administrators in the school fight with the teachers or fight with the parents and don't have tools and are under resourced and under timed and under stressed and blamed. And all of that is just, it's just all there. And so I also wanted to give a corollary to, it was a good the way you said they want to be heard. That's good. But I, everything I do here, I want to be the advanced class for people. So let's say, I don't care that you want to be heard because I don't, you're just an idiot. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. So the fact you want to be heard is I don't care, grow up, you know, or mm. stop being a whiny baby or take care of yourself or, 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 which is what happens in situations. But I tell people it's a little more, a little more empathetic to say people don't want to be invisible. Yes. They true. are, their self-esteem is so whacked down. Life is hard. Life is real hard. And if you weren't incredibly lucky to have wonderful parents and all the resources you need and then wonderful partners and wonderful friends and your body will work correctly and your brain will work correctly and you will have wonderful opportunities. Who's, I mean, how, how, what few people actually have that gifted life? Everybody else is battle scarred, but you don't see it. It's battle scarred on our souls. So you don't really know. And a lot of times these people that are the most vitriolic and negative and nasty are literally saying, I'm not invisible. I'm important. And the only way I can get attention is to be as obnoxious and loud as I can. And so we diffuse them. And I have this whole thing that I'm actually putting on my website and I posted it on my LinkedIn yesterday because I've been very upset with the, all these mass shootings. It's just very upsetting. And it, what can you do? What can you do? And then if I write another book and write another article, it's just too hard to get people to read stuff quick. So I wrote a quick little post that I put on my LinkedIn and then I put it on my holdingthecom.com website. And what I'm calling it is check your tone. Because if you look at a lot of the things that have happened recently, one guy, and it's not to blame anyone, God forbid, life is hard and tough, but an employee damages something and you say you have to pay for it. Well, you can say you damaged it and we have to work out a payment plan or you damage it, you're going to pay for it, you bad guy. For somebody else, I'm going to reject you. I'm not going to the prom with you. Or think about that guy in Uvalde. He shot his grandmother in the face. Okay, tell me about that relationship. Now, right or wrong, good or bad, I, you know, I would never think to even put an opinion on that because it's too complex. But we can certainly see that there are asteroids surrounding the Earth, and one of them is going to come crashing in. So NASA has a big deal about trying to find them and shoot them off course. Well, we have asteroid people zipping around us, and they don't behave well, and they don't act well, and they don't get validation and support because they don't act right. Those are the dangerous ones. 
That's where the risk is. In almost all these situations, everybody went, well, we knew he was going to go crazy or, oh, that was a problem. And if those people get the teensiest bit of an injection of human kindness, teensiest bit, we can knock asteroids off the course. And I'm doing that more and more and more, even something simple like how you drive, pushing the button on the elevator and where you get into an elevator with people. It's where and how can, and I'm not necessarily a gentle person. I'm, I was a type A business trial lawyer. I mean, I was a woman business trial lawyer 30, 40, almost 40 years ago now when women didn't do that. So I was tough, I was hard and you had to be, to be taken seriously. And I'm trying to be as gentle as I can in little unimportant situations with the waiter, you know, driving, like I said, all these little subtle things, smiling at people, nodding. How can we inject just a little bit of human kindness? Don't worry about saying the right words. Words are like kind of irrelevant. It's the tone. Yes. And maybe we can knock asteroids off the course. You know, you may never know, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Actually, I had a story of a teacher just recently who, um, a friend of mine who did very much what you're talking about. Is there was a, there was a, a student that she felt was there was some disruption there. There was something there, tension there. She didn't know what it was. And so she was just kind to him. And it turns out that he did have some psychotic breakdown or whatever, and, and uh, was going to uh, hurt one of the other students. And, uh, and she said, wow, you know, she said, I'm so grateful that I kind of followed that prompt to be kind to that student, at least to use it enough to take him kind of off that course. And so um, very, very powerful. I wanna shift gears here because I would be remiss with your experience as a negotiator to ask you a little bit about, cause I'm sure there's people that are listening, that business leaders are like, give me the, give me the, like, how do I negotiate even these business deals that, you know, you've got, and I know you've talked about it in your book at length, there's two parties, they both want whatever they want and somehow you're able to bring them together. So we talked about conflict, but now we're talking about even just that conflict or whatever deal-making. in terms of, in terms of self-interest, in terms of, yeah, deal-making and, and for both parties yeah. to get, to be, to be a win for both parties. Indeed. Indeed. So nowadays, I mean, I've done every kind of case you can possibly imagine, but nowadays people hire me and, you know, someone will say, I want a hundred million dollars. And the other side will say, here's hundred thousand, go away. You know, you don't settle those with logic, reason, and rationale. They all have fantastic lawyers and lots of good arguments and none of that actually works. So the first thing is that bomb detector you diagnose because just because somebody says something doesn't make it true and doesn't make it what they really want, even though they say it's what they want. So I always look to identify the self-interest. Is what you're saying you want really in your self-interest? And if it's not, what are you really asking for? Is it deflection? Look at the shiny object over here. Will I do something else? Is it, I think I only have one style of negotiating, so I have to be aggressive, anchor high, so that you will know I mean business. You know, do I have to act like, pshaw, I don't care about you at all? I mean, what is the tactic that the person is using? So you really see that first. And I will tell you, I have done more than 10,000 deals in my life. And there's an absolute truism. You identify the self-interest, you identify the self-interest, you align them, period, period. No deal happens without self-interest being aligned. Now, the question is, what is it? And that's why I have story after story after story in the book about different ways of looking at it. So can I tell the story of the two guys who uh, who uh, late at night, 30 million and 35 million yes. locked in? That was so good. That's a good one. Yes. A good one. So I have ones like, you know, someone's being killed and you know, all the other deals we have, but this is just a straight, normal business deal. Two big, big, high testosterone, big ego business guys. We're doing this big deal. It's late at night. One locks in at 30 million. The other locks in at 35 million. How are you going to break that? So of course, split the difference. Absolutely not. It becomes an ego thing. I told you that was my bottom line. I told you that was my bottom line. So now they're tough and they're hard and they're in it. So what do I do? Humor is, if you can be funny and inject humor, God bless you. It's like the most amazing thing to, re- to release tension. 
And so I looked at them and I said, all right, I respect that. We've got that goal. So you know how we're going to do it? We're going to arm wrestle for it. And they look at me like, what? Like, are you insane? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we're going to do for it. Uh, or I'll give you another choice. We could do it Indiana Jones style and we can line up cheap tequila in shot glasses all along the table. And the last one still sitting in their chair at the end of drinking all the shots gets that extra 5 million. Now they're starting to laugh. And then they're joking that one of them is older and one of them is younger. And the younger guy goes, well, I like the arm wrestling idea. And the older guy goes, well, I like the drinking idea. And then before you know it, we're joking. And I said, or, you know, we can flip a coin. And they look at me crazy. I reached into my purse and I grabbed a quarter. And I said, let's do it. And I flipped this coin up in the air. One of the guys reaches over and grabs it midair and says, Ugh, I can't have it be I'm a public company. I can't have it be that I you know, flipped a $5 million coin. All right, we'll split the difference. Done. And it took, what, eight minutes? Now, Brilliant. that's because I didn't use logic, reason, and rationale. You should, did you know that the trial system is like a casino anyway, and it's very dangerous and you could lose? Or, or, or. That isn't going to motivate anybody for nothing. It doesn't work like that. So you, remember chapter one of the book, you speak into the ears that are hearing you. What's important to them? What do they want? And so I'll give our listeners uh, another psychological piece to play with. There was a guy named Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. They were psychiat psychologists and they won a Nobel Prize in economics because economics had been very much about the rational man making rational economic decisions. And they proved, oh, contraire, mon cher. No, it's not rational. It is actually irrational. And it's as Big deal. And so the concept is, is that we all assume when you're in a negotiation with me, you want to win. 85% of the time, that's not it. It's that you don't want to lose. Yes. Ah, very different analysis now. How do I do something where I'm assuming you want to win, but you just don't want to lose? So you're protecting that soft candy center. Well, now I've got a whole lot more options right? I mean, I've settled cases with man of the year dinners, you know, with donations to charity. I actually did one, just this one's not in the book. It'll just make you laugh where it was two big, big, big business guys. And they were, the estate was worth oh, several hundreds of millions of dollars. And they'd been best friends and partners for 40 years and then had a huge, terrible falling out. And so now it was like a divorce. I mean, it was just awful, right? So we finally get it all the way down, everything negotiated and I had a hundred grand left. And we couldn't figure out what to do with that hundred grand. And they hated each other. And all they told me was stories about how evil and bad the other one was and all that terrible stuff he did. Cheated on his taxes, cheated on his wife, stole money here, did this. And I helped him do the stealing. So I know it's true. I mean, stuff like that. It was super intense. So finally, I thought, well, remember, it's not, I'm, not, I'm not a moralist here. I'm not going to change anyone's mind. So you hate him, right? All right. For this hundred grand left, you're going to make him give $50,000 to any charity that you darn well please. And I go, the other guy, you're going to take $50,000 and make him give it to any charity you want. They sat there twirling like a little, you know, proverbial mustaches. <laughs> How can I punish him by making him give 50 grand to charity that he hates? And in the end, what do you, who do I care? A hundred grand went to different charities. What difference did it finally make? But they got that <laughs> a little pleasure out of being able to do it. Now, I didn't walk into that case that day saying, oh, I have a brilliant idea of what I'm going to do. No, but I'm looking at them. I'm speaking into the ears that are hearing me. I'm holding the calm. I'm using my tools. And I say, what do these guys need? They needed to punish each other. And they were using the court as a punishment. Well, they could do that. They could get, you know, spend 10 years in court with each other. It'd be a terrible waste of money, time, resources. And in the end, it never really, it never really works because someone eventually will win. So here I created a way they could punish each other. All right, fine. You know, so you look at your difficult boss or your difficult coworker or your your kid's coach or your neighbor, any of that. What do they need? Is it needing to be heard? Is it not being invisible? Is it being important? Is it just not feeling like a loser because they feel like a loser in their life? A lot of times people that have really vehement, fundamentalist, aggressive opinions, 
inside think that they're losers. And that's why they, they, they speak so aggressively, you know, that there's no other opinion, but theirs because inside their self-esteem is just crumbling hot. Yeah. So what can you find that's good about them and validating about them and don't even deal with the issue? I, I, I'm never going to talk you into or out of abortion. Why would I even try to do that? That's just silly. But you get to what's really going on and why that issue is important to them. Yeah, that's so good. It's fun. It, it's fun. It, and it's you hard. Must, yeah. it's like, spaghetti sauce, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And oh my gosh, there's so much here. And uh, I know your book is, is full of all these tips. This one last thing that I thought would be interesting to talk about, is it ever appropriate to yell? <laughs> you read that, was, that story in the book. I yes. Love, I love yes. it. Yes. 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 So I am not a kumbaya gal. I'm really not. I mean, I'm a deeply spiritual person. I'm vegetarian, but that's in my personal life. When you're involved with other human beings, you don't impose yourself on them. You enter their world and you dance with them. That's if you have the maturity of knowing how to hold calm. And so I actually had a case once where this guy uh, was a manufacturer of candles. It was a whole big thing. And he was just, he didn't get along with his lawyer. He's just screaming and yelling like crazy. And I'm looking at him and I tried Vox and I tried naming the emotion and I tried decompressing him and none of that was working. So remember, you don't know if somebody is off their meds, needs meds, hasn't gotten sleep, you know, was abused, trauma, PTSD. Like you just don't know what is inside that human meat suit package, right? So I tried those things and they didn't work. So then I thought, all right, I got to help him. He can't, get, he's in this yelling, angry place and he can't get down. And so I matched him. He's yelling. I'm, I'm listening to him and I'm yelling right back. And then slowly, because I was in control of myself, and he was not, I slowly got quieter and quieter and quieter. And he started matching me. And by the time we got done, he looked at me, <laughs> you get it <laughs> like this. And his lawyer's looking at me like, oh, gee, what just happened there? But, you know, now it's not going to work all the time. I mean, there was one time I did it and it didn't work. Okay, try something else. That's why like this is holding the calm kind of book one. That's why I have 20 tools. Yeah. So we get the master these and then you got more. So, you know, what do I do out of servant leadership? You know, how can I help you? Now that's if I'm real mature, either I'm a third party or I'm in a two party conflict, but I'm real mature. But well, let's say I'm not real mature and my amygdala is triggered and I'm tired and I'm hangry and I'm this and I'm that and whatever. The mantra, holding the calm, holding the calm, holding the calm, gives me space so I can choose what I want to say. And it is completely mature to say, I need to go to the bathroom. You know what? I need an hour to process some of this. And then we'll talk about it again in an hour. Because I don't want to say things that are not thoughtful. And I want to hear what it is you had to say. And you give yourself a time. There is nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, that is super healthy and great boundaries and good maturity. And then when you come back, you say, you know, what's really good about you. You gave me the space and time to process information. And I want to understand more why that's so important to you. What just happened to that conflict? Yeah. Seriously. Right. Yeah. So powerful. It's magic stuff. It's just magical stuff. It really is. So yeah. I wrote this book. Everybody should have access to this. Yes. You know, we should be teaching the schools, you know? And if I can say what I chose to do is I put a discussion guide in the back. And I know a lot of authors make it a workbook and charge extra. And I said, I don't want to do any of that. I want to just give it away for free. So I put it in the back of the book so that people can, you know, you can, everyone's training budgets are being cut these days. So if you can't afford to bring some fancy trainer in, create a book club, you know, yeah. it's a group of you within an organization, you all buy the book. It's super inexpensive and you sit and you read it together. And then you go over the questions in the back. And what's so interesting about the questions, cause I tested it, focus grouped it, obviously, is that someone would read the answer 
read number one and say, well, the answer obviously is this. Of course it's that. And somebody else would go, well, that's not the way I read it. I thought it was this, this, or this. You're kidding me. That can't, what? Yeah. yeah. Now, diagnostic ability is happening, listening ability, sentence stems, all the cool and wonderful stuff in the book. You get a chance to practice it. And then in the end, what it will do is it will bond that group better together. So if you've got a difficult person, invite them in the group. That's how you defang them. And yeah. you'll end up going, I see another side of you that I hadn't seen before. And oh, that's why you were so angry. Okay. The bonding that comes from that within teams is tremendous. Tremendous. Yeah. That's so good. I think about some of my closest friends. Um, I have a couple of friends of mine that when I first met them, I did not hit it off with them at all. And for different reasons. One, I made assumptions. Actually, that's not true. Both of them I made assumptions about when I was in my like late teens, early 20s. I'm like, oh, I see her. This is like you talked about at the beginning. And I think mm -hmm. about it. And now 30 years later, we're still friends because I sought to understand, we had that opportunity to get to know each other. And it's like, wow. And I think there's a lot of friendships that can come when you talk about the discussion together. There's a lot of friendships. You can bond over this as a team, but even yeah. just like, wow, I never knew you thought that way. And now all of a sudden you see that, that shared reality mm -hmm. experience, that shared reality between you. It's just amazing. So it, it makes yeah. it feel, you know, Life is hard. Our society is challenging. I mean, sometimes I read the news and go, God, why am I reading the news? I mean, it's just, there is so much bumper car ego, nasty, difficult stuff out there, right? So I have to keep injecting optimism and happiness and joy and connectivity into me. Yes. And so if you're with people and you're just talking about whatever, it doesn't really matter all of a sudden there's a connectivity to it. And I'll give you one more little strange example. I did a training for a, a, a government agency brought me in to do a, a Zoom training for them. And this was earlier on in the pandemic when you're still trying to figure out how to keep people's attention on Zoom. And so I have all this good stuff I'm gonna do in the training. And as an icebreaker, just on a lark, cause I make stuff up all the time based on my group and what I think people need. You know, I had a couple of people there that had that been here, done that face, like, ugh another training. What are you going to tell me, lady? You know, so I had to break through some of that. So I just said, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? And I had like 20 people there. And I said, or maybe it's 30. And I said, put it in the chat. I don't want to poll. I don't want any of that junk. Just actually write it in the chat. And then I started riffing on it. Oh my God, somebody likes Rocky Road. You like soft, gooey stuff, right? And then they start laughing. Oh, vanilla, you're a purist. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, Sherbert, <laughs> we like the sweet heart stuff. And I'm just joking on it. And all of a sudden, everyone's reading the chats. And the guy that I think is the biggest jerk also likes Rocky Road like me. Are you kidding me? And then I'm the vanilla purist and you like vanilla. And someone else goes, no, chocolate is the only way I would have it. Someone else, they were bonding over this little silly thing I invented in the chat feature. And then we went into all this deep stuff and it was fantastic. And then in the reviews that the agency, you know, gave me afterwards, how great the training it was, and it was well worth the money. And yeah, 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 yeah. One of the things they loved the best, not all the deep, deep, deep stuff I had done, the ice cream thing, because they bonded and connected with each other in a way that they had never seen or thought of, which humanizes us. Yes. And if we all had time to understand all the battle scars on our souls, for all the crap that we have all been through in our lives, we'd have much more compassion and empathy with each other. We would, yes. I mean, we would, but who's going for that? You're in my way and I got to yeah. go and you do what I tell you to do and don't take my idea. And that's yeah. back to my, you know, it's exhausting. Inject some humans into the veins of yeah. society, everybody. Yeah. A little bit. That's A little so bit. good. Yeah. Well, and it's, and we would realize how similar we actually are if we actually set aside our differences and look to the yeah. things that, that were, that are similar. It's so powerful. Hesha, thank you so oh, much. I knew this was going to be a great conversation. <laughs> I was 
couldn't wait for it because I was like, yes, I just know reading your book. I literally, I was reading your book and I'm talking to my husband. I'm like, oh, I, can I tell you this story? And he's trying to listen to something else. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, just can, can I, can I one more, one more, one more. So, so good. So I encourage our listeners and our viewers, go get a copy of Holding the Calm. It's on Amazon, all the different places. And of course, on her website, holdingthecalm.com. And there's lots of other resources there. Uh, get a copy of that for yourself, for yourself to, for, to start off with. But then also for the people around you that you're, that are on your team, you know, even in your family, you know, I mean, it is worth it. It is absolutely worth reading. So I would encourage you to that. Hesha, so again, I just thank you that. so much. What's that? My, my pleasure. My pleasure. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all had lexicon together where someone's being difficult and you say, can I hold the calm for you? Just imagine what would happen. Yeah. Yes, please. This one's yeah. just driving me crazy. Yeah. I can see that. I mean, God. And, and even, I, yeah, that's because, a big thing. Well, because, yeah, we didn't get to that. But even like the person, if you see a conflict in others, can you hold the space for them, right? Can you actually inject that into a space where maybe you're seeing two others um, go at yeah. it. And, uh, I've, I've, I've done that. And it's, it's like time out and here are friends and they're, it's going South real quick, you know? And, and I'm like, can I just, I'm watching this happen. Then I go, can I just jump here just for a, for a moment? And it's like, well, what I heard you That's say, right. and what I heard you say, and then all of a sudden they're like, and it was gone. It was done. It was done just lovely. like that. And so to be able to do it's that is, is so rewarding. So, yeah. And it's if good. people are not, if they're nervous of the skills, because you've got the skills, I've got the skills, we practice it. So I tell people, if you're nervous, the sentence stems are your training wheels. Yes. They are so good. You walk into somebody in conflict and say, wow, what an interesting conversation. You know, what's really good about you. And you know, what's really good about you. You seem to really care about the same issue here. And you said to her, blah, and you said to him, blah, blah. I mean, it just changes everything. And then they look at you like, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. And then it also awesome. it works. I know it's a work podcast. People won't say, oh, you know how to hold the calm. What they'll say is, you just get along. You just seem to be able to work with people. You're just a good leader. You're mm -hmm. a good team member. That's what they're going to say. Then I go, you took a course and like you mastered this skill. Oh, they're just going to go mad skills. You did this. That was excellent. People just seem to like you or, you know, I feel like I can talk to you. Yeah. Stuff like that is actually yeah. what happens. Or they start and coming to you and they start saying, I'm dealing with this issue. Can you help me? Cause I don't know how to deal with this and this and this, because you just, it's like, I remember years ago, I felt like I had this R this was long before I got into the formally into coaching and training, but it was like, do I have an R on my forehead? Like for relationship, <laughs> you know, person, but people would come to me with all these questions, just like you're saying, and it's, and it's rewarding to be able to be that for someone else. It's just awesome. So yeah, it's good. Well, for our listeners, I always say that leaders of transformation take action. And so take action on something today, you know, get a copy of Hesha's book. Uh, her book is called holding the calm. I think she's frozen on our screen, by the way, if you're wondering. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll, uh, hopefully she'll come back before we, we, officially wrap up here, but, um, I just encourage you to go to, go get a copy of her book, holding the calm, go to her website, holding the calm.com. We'd love to hear your stories. You can go on, uh, leaders of transformation.com and you can reach out to us. We'd love to hear how this has impacted you. Uh, you can find us of course on social and, uh, reach out to us there as well. And we just appreciate you listening. We appreciate Hesha being here. We lost her on the, on the video, but, um, uh, anyway, just, we just really appreciate you being here and we look forward to seeing you another episode of leaders of transformation real soon.